Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Wood Solutions webinar on resilient timber homes. In the spirit of reconciliation, Forest and Wood Products Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia. We acknowledge their connection to the land and their custodianship of country and forests. We pay our respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So uh, just a few words on Wood Solutions. My name's Alistair Woodhead. I'm one of the Wood Solutions team. Um, Wood Solutions is an initiative funded by uh, Forest and Wood Products Australia. It really is there for all building professionals like yourselves. We want to inspire you to use wood. And then if you're interested in doing so, we want to provide you with the right information and information resources to do those projects correctly. So we undertake a range of different uh, events, uh, such as the um, these webinars, also face-to-face -face seminars, but most importantly, um, we produce a lot of technical information, which is uh, delivered out through a whole range of technical design guides that uh, um, that we, we do. We've got 53 of those at the moment, which you can download from our, our Wood Solutions website at woodsolutions.com.au. Just a reminder that uh, we also run quite a few events. So if you're interested to know um, what events are coming up, just go to the Wood Solutions website and either click on the events tab or type it into the uh, into the search box and you'll be able to see the events for each month. Also a reminder that um, all the webinars that we do are recorded. So if you'd like to go back and review those or let your colleagues know about them, again, either type webinars into the search function or go to the resources tab, webinars and podcasts and under Wood Solutions um, Tuesday webinars, you'll find all of the, uh, the webinars that we've um, delivered over the last couple of years. So in interacting in today's webinar, if you'd like to chat amongst yourselves, please feel free to do that. Um, use the all panelists and attendees um, button down the bottom there. But more importantly, we're very keen to get your questions, which um, we'll answer as many as we can at the uh, end of the um, webinar today. Um, if you like a question, click on the thumbs up. That'll just prioritize at the top. But yeah, just add your questions as we go throughout the presentations. <laughs> also, um, you can get CPD points for today's webinar. Um, I'll run through the three CPD questions shortly. You'll need for your self-assessment. Just keep those. Uh, you don't need to email any answers back to us. Um, you'll receive a certificate of completion within a week of attending the webinar. And just check your uh, junk mail. If you don't see it in your normal mail, sometimes it might end up there. And please store those certificates in a safe place because we really can't reissue those uh, after each webinar. So in terms of our presenters today, it does give me great pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Firstly, will be Dr. Paolo Levici. Wood Solutions Resilient Timber House Program Manager. With a PhD in Industrial Technologies Wood, Paolo worked in the industry for seven years before starting an independent timber consulting and engineering practice. He's been involved in the design and specification of multi-storey buildings, prefabricated homes and transportable units, and the design of cross-laminated timber manufacturing plants. Paolo joined Wood Solutions in 2016 as part of the Midrise construction team, and he now continues his work as the manager of the Wood Solutions Resilient Timber Homes Program, which we'll be talking about today. Our second speaker today will be James McIntosh, who's a senior manager at Building Consultancy Division with Sedgwick. James's experience is in construction, where he spent the first 12 years of his career before transitioning to building consultancy in 2008. He's specialised in forensic building consultancy in various fields, including insurance and strata defects which required him to develop specialised teams of building consultants, of engineers, project managers, and quantity surveyors right around Australia. James's team performs damage assessment and cost services for insurance losses, including flood, fire, and wind events, providing significant experience in determining repair methodologies for properties to ensure building code compliance and upgrades. So a couple of great speakers today. In terms of the learning outcomes, what we hope you'll get from this is an understanding of the importance of resilient design principles and methods, an understanding of the best approaches to resilient design for bushfire, flood and high wind areas, and an understanding of the insurance implications and suggested solutions for improving the resiliencies of homes in flood prone areas. The three CPD questions we're suggesting, and I'll put these in the chat function shortly, uh, list three reasons why resilient home design is today so important. List three suggested solutions for improving the resiliency of homes in bushfire prone areas and list three suggested solutions for improving the resiliency of homes in flood prone areas. So without further ado, I'll sh stop sharing my screen and I'll hand over to Paolo, who will start the presentation and then hand to James and then tail it at the end. So Paolo, over to you. Thank you, Alastair. And thank you, all of you, 
online for this webinar. Can you see my screen, Alastair? Yeah, all looking good. We're ready. Thanks. So resilient timber homes. We about us. Uh, Alastair already made an introduction. F WPA is a not-for-profit industry services company. We are independent, non-commercial, and provide evidence-based information, training, and research and development activities through established collaboration with a number of uh, bodies, organizations, and agencies, etc., in Australia, including all those who refer to building and construction. <clears throat> Why are we talking about resilient timber homes today and in general? <clears throat> because resilient timber homes are already available. Timber homes are resilient when they are designed and built well. The National Construction Code and the Australian Standard already have a number of robust and proven provisions, proven provisions for timber homes. And if history matters anything, we can say that 80% of existing homes in Australia are, have with timber structures and 70% of the new homes currently built today, probably a bit more than that, uh, they have timber structures. So they have been and still are Australia's preferred choice for a reason, because they are fit for the climate and the purposes with which we build. As Wood Solutions, we have a number of design guides that um, directly or indirectly refer to resilient timber. If you see the photo on the left, you will see that the nails show what was the cross section of that timber beam before the fire. And you will see that now the section is almost half, but the stability of the beam is still there. It has not collapsed. While uh, non-combustible material like steel certainly doesn't burn, certainly doesn't uh, change its overall cross section, but it changes its shape with heat. And on the right, you will see uh, the front page of an article a few years ago, this nice house, which will be one of the case studies that I will illustrate, did survive a real bushfire, while 20 other buildings around it uh, didn't. So <clears throat> what's the problem with uh, uh, resiliency in Australia? Australia uh, is very heavily interested by uh, floods, bushfires, and cyclones. Apparently, uh, we in Australia have uh, five times higher chances to be displaced from our home than the average European citizen. This is creating a problem of uh, a number of, of uh, areas in Australia are already uninsurable or close to being uninsurable in the coming years and floods are by far the main problem. The Insurance Council of Australia has partnered with Master Builder Australia to tackle these uh, problems in a proactive way. And they are creating strong policies. They are creating design options. And we are collaborating with them as well, as you can imagine. Then the government has organized the Natural Azar Research Australia. It's a collaborative research organization that uh, tackles the problems into this sector, and they are very, very much focused to delivering usable research and knowledge. So please have a look uh, at their website and activities. They are interesting. And uh, other parts of the industry are reacting to uh, this in a proactive way. For instance, the steel industry has partnered with a number of uh, partners, insurers, uh, universities, and the like, and CSIRO. They have organized some nice uh, concepts and prototypes, and they've tested these prototypes, uh, especially for bushfire, but uh, in a way that currently does not comply with the Australian standard for uh, testing uh, materials for bushfires. So therefore, uh, there is an evolution in, 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 in many sectors. Our program from uh, FWPA has a uh, Clear value proposition, we want to develop and test a better method to design and construct, which goes beyond business as usual and minimum court requirements. And we want to do it in order to be beneficial to both the program partners and the home owners and users uh, that will use this home. So how 
how we're doing this. Uh, I will start with bushfire. With bushfire, you can refer to Australian Standard 3959 and to our guide number four, which is frequently updated as soon as the standard is updated or as soon as the code is updated, we do update our guide. The guide explains quite well with graphic examples, uh, the main concepts and the details that you need to use into the design. And this is an example that I was mentioning. The Rosedale Beach House by Thomas Cadet architect from one of his clients was built in 2018. He designed it for the flaming zone, according to the applicable standards and concessions which were made at that point in time. And then it did survive a bushfire with very minor damages. Actually, only the window gaskets were needed to be replaced. This is why the way it was built on, on steel stamps with normal timber structures and bar 40 windows and shutters. This was a concession from the council and New South Wales Fire Authority in that moment in time, which is no longer offered. So please check always the updated uh, approach with the local authorities and with the local designers and builders if you want uh, to be on top of the latest advice. And you can also refer to us. We have uh, bushfire and code specialist, namely Boris Iskra, one of our colleagues who is always uh, ready to help. This is what happened. This house resisted very, very well, as I said, while 18 nearby houses were destroyed, like in this case, or severely compromised to the point that they were not fit for uh, being inhabited again and they had to be demolished. Well, this is still there to be enjoyed by their owners. Then cyclones, that's another area for which there is already very, uh, good guidance into the year 1684, which is the typical um, standard for uh, uh, residential timber frame construction. Part three is specific to cyclonic areas. And our guide 40 details and explains with examples and with uh, uh, further comments how to apply it in, uh, in your uh, design and construction. There's a number of readily available construction system and details and connectors and components that uh, are referring to this um, specific uh, type of risk. So therefore, it's just a matter of uh, finding the right approach and using the right products in the correct way uh, to get the result. Just an example of a very robust and resilient design that uh, marries well, that combines well form and function is this from ISSHO Architects <clears throat> in a Pacific Island. It's uh, at the same time quite robust, simple and beautiful. And uh, I wanted to finish with this example from the US. They have even a bigger problem than we have because they have tornadoes not just cyclones on the coast, but tornadoes that are very strong and form hundreds of kilometers away from the coast. Therefore, they have invested a lot of money and effort into organizing a huge wind tunnel that can test even and even two homes next to each other. And they have developed a big approach as to uh, how to design and install the best materials for uh, fighting, um, preventing the damages from tornadoes. And that's from the insurance sector. The Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety have organized all this, including delivering research, standards, professional training, and qualification of the installers. So a full 360 degrees approach to making uh, homes safer uh, and longer lasting for uh, their owners. Then floods, that's the big problem for us. And also because, yes, there are some technical guidance from us, from some uh, local councils and governments, and they are quite interesting. We are working out a technical design guide specific about resilient timber homes, which will be issued uh, within this calendar year, but the 
National Construction Code and the Australian standard do not provide specific design guidance like for uh, uh, push buyers and, uh, and um, cyclone. So Sedgwick has a significant experience into this and I would like to stop my presentation now, hand over to James for his presentation. Then I will go on with a few more examples uh, with uh, respect to the tree that he will uh, introduce to you and draw some conclusions and then wait for your question. Thanks. Thank you, Paolo. And, uh, and thank you, Alastair, for the introduction earlier. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to present to this group um, and welcome to, to all the participants that we have here today. Um, my name is James McIntosh. Um, I'm the Senior Manager of Cedric Building Consultants and Division. The presentation that I'll be going through today, um, I've previously presented at um, the Northern Rivers Reconstruction Conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, specifically, that was in relation to uh, a resilient homes program that the New South Wales government um, is rolling out presently um, in those northern those areas, those local councils affected by the Northern Rivers flooding event in 2022. Um, so I was there to speak about my experiences uh, with multiple flood events um, to lead some discussions around resilient building, both at a new home design phase, but also uh, retrospectively what can we do to properties to, to make them more resilient for the next event that comes around? And we do expect that there will be uh, ongoing events occurring in these communities. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about context, I guess, our role and our experience in flood events. Uh, I'm going to talk about damage profiles, um, basically a, a damage model that we establish as a result of known symptoms uh, of a property when they experience uh, a significant flood event. I'm going to go through three recent case studies, three different events occurring in different locations, and then talk a little bit about solutions that's available to the industry. Uh, and also then talk about some limitations that we have around the funding that's available through an insurance policy. So a little bit about Cedric Building Consultancy to provide that context of what we provide. We do engineering and building consultancy inspection reports. That's uh, identification of damage, quite often identifying underlying issues at a property, remembering that some properties might be 100 years old, 50 years old, 10 years old and, and new. Um, and as a result, there's, um, there's often some significant challenges that we face uh, inherent in that pro those properties. Uh, we provide detailed scopes of work, which are ultimately the methodology of what needs to be done um, to rectify a property. Um, those properties that sustain structural damage, we manage the building approval pathway um, and we also provide costing services through our quantity surveying and estimating teams. Uh, and that often flows through to tendering and ongoing construction management of those projects on behalf of our clients. So as it relates to flood events, um, the services that I've just shared with you, uh, we've applied those services across uh, numerous events, um, you know, in all different perils, I guess, uh, from wind events to flood to bushfire. Um, but these three events that you've got on your screen here, uh, I'm going to showcase them because they're all, whilst they're all flood events, they're all unique in terms of um, the event that are, that unfolded. So the, the first on the left uh, is a current event, the River Murray flooding, which occurred late 2022, <coughs> excuse me, into 2023. And we still have engineers and, and teams on the ground um, in those regional areas of River Murray um, conducting their inspections at the moment. And then there's the the southeast Queensland and, and northern rivers flooding. That's a screenshot taken from near map there of the uh, of the Lismore area, South Lismore and Lismore. Um, and then there's the Townsville regional flooding event that occurred in February 2019. All three unique events. Before I go into those actual case studies, 
<clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I'm fighting a, a flu is the tail end of it, and I might need to cough quite a bit. Um, when it comes to you know managing compliance and regulation from a, for a flood uh, response, it can be quite challenging. If you consider, uh, this is another property we're involved in on the, on the left-hand screen uh, image there. It's a new home. Obviously, it's subject to the building approval pathway. Um, the National Construction Code Volume 2 is very, very um, clear in terms of um, the construction detailing for that property. Um, there are a number of Australian standard publications that dictate um, the trade performance, individual trade performance from you know, the, the footing system right through to the way the brickworks constructed, our waterproofing standards, um, you know, even internal finishes, plastering and the like. There's an Australian standard that um, regulates our industry on, on minimum acceptable standards. And then, of course, each individual project has a series of design documents um, that go to that building approval pathway to ensure that that building is, is certainly designed fit for purpose, but then constructed fit for purpose in accordance with that design documentation through routine inspections um, and certification activities. So quite a fair bit of compliance and regulation associated with the new build. Now, when it comes to significant damage that's occurred in a flood scenario, we recognise that there's actually no building regulation or Australian standard publication instructing the industry on what is the minimum acceptable method of repair. Um, so it can become a little bit subjective at times uh, in terms of what is necessary to rectify that property um, and also what is necessary to bring it up to um, a, a level of um, a quality. Now, the other thing that challenges us significantly, if you consider it, the design phase of a building, there's, there's currently, and as Paolo alluded to previously in, in his last slide, uh, the National Construction Code does not provide us specific design guidance to the avoidance of a flood, i.e. Um, what materials to use. However, it is very, very clear. I, I believe the industry is very well informed in terms of design guidance for the avoidance of cyclone damage and certainly the avoidance of bushfire um, is very well covered in the NCC. And I think the uh, the Black Saturday bushfires that occurred in, in Victoria, um, I think it was around 2007 or 2008, as a result of that, we um, we had Australian Standard 3959 um, created. It was now provides very, very clear expectation uh, or minimum practice available to the industry to prepare a property um, for bushfire attack. Uh, referring to the bushfire attack levels that are nominated on a case-by-case site-specific basis. So what does this mean for the industry uh, in terms of how we respond to a flood event? So with no specific um, compliance or regulation that we can rely upon for the assessment of a flood damage property, there is certainly some great design guidance documents out there at the moment. Um, but we need to establish uh, a bit of a damage profile individual to the, the property. So some of the things we consider here is obviously the depth of the flood water throughout the property. And we recognise that often the depth um, determines the duration of that submersion. So we, we recognise that high water events uh, are often retained inside the property for an extended period of time where low water inundation generally comes and goes relatively quickly. The nature of the event, uh, was it a fast flowing event, i.e. Um, high water surge, or um, was it a steady rise? Because we recognise fast flowing water can often result in damage to footing systems and the like, as opposed to a steady rising water, which is what was experienced in the River Murray, um, generally doesn't necessarily create scouring or undermining of footing systems. Uh, the water quality, we recognise that we have had some clean water events, if you like, whilst they all come from riverine um, catchment areas. Quite often the water is not necessarily detrimental to the building, um, but quite often we do experience, as we did in the Townsville event, Category 3 black water 
um, which is highly contaminated. The construction method of the building, um, we need to consider that and you know we're going to showcase a few different methods of um, construction. When I say construction, I'm talking about you know is it elevated, is it low set, is it masonry wall versus cavity construction, these sorts of things that we need to consider. The age and condition of the property. So the age is one thing, the condition of it is another. As we recognise that properties that are more susceptible to damage are quite often the age ones that have been in poor working order or in poor condition prior to the event occurring, where we have seen cases where properties can be old in nature. However, when they're well maintained and in good working order, i.e. The, the paint coating to timber weatherboards, they can withstand um, flood events reasonably, reasonably well. And then of course, visible characteristics and overall performance um, following the flood event. So these are the considerations that we, we, we go through to understand the degree of damage to a property and therefore inform the method of repair or quantity of repair. So let's have a look at case study number one, the River Murray flooding, which is uh, ongoing. Um, sorry, it, it's ongoing in terms of our investigations and, and preparation of repair scopes and the like. The water has receded at this point in time. However, this is interesting. It was a dry weather event. So what that means, um, no water, uh, no significant amount of rain fell in these areas that are now affected majority of the water flowed down from New South Wales and even Queensland down through the um, Murray-Darling system where it discharges out into the ocean uh, in Goolwa. There was weeks of prior notice provided to the occupants of these communities. So um, authorities uh, were able through, you know, um, hydraulical uh, mapping and modelling were able to understand um, the effects that were going to be um, experienced in these communities weeks before they actually occurred. As a result, um, a high percentage of these properties were unoccupied at the time, um, but that's also as a result of some of these areas are holidaying communities um, on, the, on the River Murray system. Um, and uh, a lot of these properties, as a result of the depth of the water, um, and the long, slow event that occurred were submerged in water for several months, okay? So when you consider other flood events that we've experienced um, on the East Coast, if you like, where the water rises and falls reasonably quick, um, we've had several properties or several communities that have been affected by flood waters to varying depths for upwards of three months. As a result, um, what we've started to experience is uh, non-durable timber, if you like, um, radiata pine has started to significantly decay, um, you know, through that period of, um, of flood water inundation being several months, um, plywood bracing sheets starting to break up and deteriorate significantly as well. Um, typically, plasterboard linings in a flood event stay um, in situ, however, obviously sustained damage. But what we've recognised in the River Murray floods is plasterboard is completely decayed, broken up, um, and um, you know is, is no longer um, attached to the walls. Obviously, glass wall insulation becomes compromised, uh, and we also recognise with this event our galvanised wall frame strapping, whether it's bracing or stud ties and the like. Um, is is displaying um, signs of corrosion and and um, deterioration as a result of ongoing water ingress. This is an interesting one. This external wall cladding, um, which is a colour bond steel material, um, was submerged for in excess of four weeks a month, uh, and that colour bond cladding has started to deteriorate significantly. Where typically um, colour bond, uh, whether it's Colour bond screening, colour bond balustrading, colour bond cladding, roofing uh, materials can generally be cleaned off and will continue to be unaffected um, as a result of a flood event. But we recognise with this River Murray event um, being submerged for such an extended period of time caused significant decay. Additionally, here we have um, treated pine wall framing, um, generally 
unaffected. Uh, but there's an example of our fixings um, and, uh, you know, it's a ground anchor there, a, a Dynabolt anchor into the slab um, featuring corrosion and also, again, our um, a metal strap wall bracing um, feature, starting to feature some corrosion as well. So here's just an example of a property uh, in that River Murray. You can see the linings are completely perished there where you'll see in um, the other case studies I demonstrate today that uh, the plasterboard remains in situ, but it's it's with this River Murray, it's completely deteriorated. Um, hollow core door there, you can see it's been removed from its um, jam and uh, significantly deteriorated as a result of um, uh, that flood water inundation. And what we recognise too, the uh, radiata pine again um, was typically compromised as a result of that ongoing flood water. We recognise en engineered LBL timber members when they've been submerged for an extended period of time display significant splitting. Um, swelling, um, and we also see um, some deterioration of fixings around where the swelling and occurring is is um, is occurring. Typically, hardwood joist systems uh, are unaffected. Um, we we recognise that um, uh, particle board sheets. In fact, we had the unfortunate event of one of our engineers putting their foot through a particle board flooring system in conducting their inspections, but generally particle board sheets uh, are compromised as a result of ongoing um, flood water. We, we also recognise that particle board, whether it's a, um, you know, a short term duration event or even if sometimes a, a flexi hose burst or something like that, particle board floor systems for short water duration are, are typically unaffected, but certainly flood water challenges that. Structural steel. So this was an interesting one for us in terms of the River Murray because we haven't necessarily experienced structural steel being compromised in low level water inundation events where the water rise and falls relatively quickly. But with the River Murray, we recognise that the ongoing duration of flood water in properties started to result in some significant deterioration of structural steel members um, um, through, the, through these communities. And there's an extreme case of um, structural steel experience significant corrosion. You can also see at the top of that image, the upper cladding. So the um, color bond uh, cladding there laid horizontally to this building um, was significantly deteriorated as well. And we we're unable to satisfactorily clean um, that cladding in this scenario as well. Case study number two. So. Northern rivers. Um, this this also featured some deep water submersion to most properties. Uh, it also had fast flowing water, unlike the River Murray. The River Murray was a steady rise. Uh, it had fast flowing water and also had long duration of submersion, but certainly not to the degree of months like we experienced in River Murray. Typically, uh, majority of the properties that we're, we've been involved in, in in the Northern Rivers region had water inside them for days rather than weeks and months. Uh, so we'd still consider days, you know, two to three to five days, a reasonably long duration event. Typically, these homes are elevated, high set, um, hardwood uh, timber construction, platform timber floors, um, external timber weatherboards, a lot of uh, casement timber windows, uh, and certainly internal finishes are a combination of hardwood strip floors, um, often masonite um, wall cladding, uh, but also some um, asbestos related materials were involved in ceilings and walls as well. The velocity of the water uh, for uh, the river, for Northern Rivers region was significant. So it, there was a lot of properties that were inundated by debris, um, fast flowing water surge, uh, and the depth of the water. This particular property, uh, this was um, submerged to, to water with uh, greater than eight metres in depth uh, and experienced a large amount of debris 
accumulating up against um, the one side of the building. So you can see a shipping container or a vehicle and then a huge amount of um, waste washed into this property. So not only are we dealing with water damage, but we're also dealing with impact damage to a lot of these properties. Uh, again, typical to, similar to the River Murray, we recognise that some engineered LVL products featured some deterioration. You can see there, gang nail plates swollen. Um, we've seen splitting again of um, bonds in the, in the material. Um, and generally, where their engineered LVL timbers have been exposed to ongoing um, flood water submersion, um, they've been compromised. Um, and, and as a result, we've had to replace those floor systems. We also recognise with the Northern Rivers event, it was unprecedented in terms of the, um, the depth of the water to some properties. And a lot of the uh, services um, that were typically housed or located in subfloor areas um, were compromised as a result of water inundation. And this particular property, whilst it had a uh, that image on, on your left there or in the centre of your screen, um, had air conditioning units elevated and mounted to the external wall of the upper storey. Um, the water depth in the, to this property was up to the gutter level. So um, everything was completely submerged and compromised as a result of this event. And in previous events, may not have been um, compromised because of the water depth. But this event certainly challenged um, the industry because things that were previously unaffected were unfortunately affected. Hardwood strip timber flooring. So what we recognise is, um, you know, that there's certainly a, a degree of inundation that hardwood strip timber floors can withstand before even showing any symptoms that they've been um, affected. So it's very typical we'll see um, peaking of strip timber floors such as the one on the image on the left. Um, but generally speaking, we can do an isolated repair in that situation um, and, and, and that floor will experience some sanitary cleaning, drying out, um, and then we'll continue to perform um, you know, for, for another lifetime. So generally speaking, as I say, particle board flooring is, is commonly compromised, but strip timber flooring is, is a different scenario for us, especially when it's laid in a elevated platform timber floor. Um, we recognise that the floor system performs differently if it's a slab on ground, um, you know, a substrate of either ply or battened, and then a strip timber flooring over that. That's a different scenario to an elevated timber floor that you see on your right, where there's a, a clear subfloor to allow for drying and, and cleaning activities to perform. Uh, yeah, so very typical to the Northern Rivers home. Recognise that those floor systems that were, I guess, a conventional style construction, hardwood, bearers and joists, um, hardwood strip timber flooring were generally uncompromised. The only things that sometimes challenged us were lateral forces. So we did experience, as you can appreciate that property that I showed before that had a shipping container and a, a van wash into it, um, had, a, had some significant damage to the floor plate um, moving laterally. And this image on the right there shows some movement associated with those brick piers as a result of lateral forces experienced to that property. So this particular property is what I was referring to um, about um, age and condition. So the image on the left shows timber weatherboard, timber casement, windows, um, timber, strip timber flooring to the balcony floor uh, and strip timber flooring throughout the internal areas as well. This property went under to the ceiling and this is the upper floor. Um, of a high set property. Underneath is the image on the right where you can see that it's um, the undercroft is just uh, for utility areas, you know, services and storage and the like on a hardwood strip timber um, flooring on hardwood um, uh, joists. The external wall cladding, despite it being fully submerged, um, was unaffected. Uh, quite simply just needed to be cleaned down, didn't even require uh, a repaint because it was in such good working order prior to the flood event. So externally, this property 
um, was relatively unaffected apart from cleaning. Now, internally, you see in the image on the right, uh, deterioration of internal finishes, which is to be expected when it's been inundated with water. Um, but generally speaking, the, the bones of the building um, uh, were completely unaffected apart from, you know, the sanitary activities that we need to do to make sure that uh, we maintain cleanliness and it's habitable for people, um, you know, into the future. So now case study number three. Now, this is an interesting one um, because the, the, the style of property uh, is more contemporary. So a lot of the areas that were involved in, in and around the Townsville area were subdivisions that were you know, less than 10 years uh, of age. Uh, the typical property was a slab on ground, masonry walls, uh, and we, we would consider this a low level water inundation event, i.e. Um, typical property had about 400 millimetres of water above finished floor level through it. And it was a short duration submersion. So it, it came relatively quickly, the water. There wasn't a lot of notice for these communities in terms of their new subdivisions anticipating flood. Um, but ultimately, the water receded quite quickly as well. So it wasn't inside these properties for an extended period of time, Some, in some cases, hours. However, what we did recognise was this was a Category 3 Blackwater event. There was large deposits of contaminated water through properties and um, um, sludge, if you like. You can see in that image on the right, the tide line in this inside this foyer is about 400 millimetres above finished floor level. Um, but you can see that the, the, the colour of the uh, material that's washed inside this property um, was significant. Um, Eyewitnesses also report one of the first signs of flood water inundating the properties was surcharge up out of their sewage system. So we, we do know that this was a significant Category 3 Blackwater event in Townsville. So the, uh, the typical home in Townsville for these, um, these newer subdivisions, and, and, and don't get me wrong, there were areas in Townsville that were of the old form of construction, um, timber weatherboard, very, very similar to the model home that I shared with you around the Northern Rivers event, but um, um, it was overwhelming in, in Townsville that a lot of the new subdivisions were inundated and they were of this form of construction, as you can appreciate, the external walls are in masonry, uh, which provides that cyclone resilience and, and thermal performance in those properties. Um, however, it was a kind of a catch-22 when those masonry walls are lined with a non-durable plasterboard wall lining, uh, which ultimately has to be removed for us to be able to replace that lining and then access the void that exists behind the lining. Um, internally, wall frames typically of um, steel and or radiator pine timber um, with plasterboard linings, obviously, which need to be uh, removed. In most cases, there was absolutely no um, deterioration to radiator pine materials because of that low level water inundation. Water rose quickly and, and receded just as quick. However, what we recognise with plasterboard linings, whilst this, this particular property only had about 200 millimetres of water through it, uh, flood water through it, we found that um, moisture um, wicks up through that plasterboard material up to about greater than 200 millimetres above that flood line. Um, and as a result, we, we, we quite often need to remove plasterboard linings up to the nearest set joint, which is typically 1200 millimetres throughout these properties. We also recognised in the image on the right, um, fibre cement linings were exactly the same. So they, they retain moisture well and truly above the flood line. Um, and what we recognised as they were as they were damp, they were um, they were, they were a little bit malleable and and um, brittle, if you like. Um, but over time, as we as we continued to monitor these properties, fibre cement dried out um, uh, completely fine, and um, there was no long term significant deterioration of um, not only the fibre cement, but um, as you'd expect but also the, the finishes that were um, relevant to the fibre cement, so tiling, waterproofing systems, that sort of thing. But we just need to be conscious of 
some bond deterioration or breakdown that can occur between waterproofing membrane systems and um, fibre cement wall linings. One of the other challenges we have, even with low level water inundation, is the concealment of moisture um, in and under um, fixtures and fittings. So for instance, these bath, this uh, enclosed bath situation in this wet area here, um, our investigations identified that long after the flood waters had receded, there was retained moisture and, and, and unfortunately contaminated black water in underneath the bath vessel um, that we needed to access and be able to sanitise and dry those areas out effectively. We recognise that uh, external masonry walls, um, whether they're core filled uh, or not, or hollow core, they do retain moisture for an extended period of time as well. So generally speaking, we found that moisture is retained inside block walls for one course above um, the flood level as well. So just something to be be conscious of as we uh, move forward with rectifications of these properties. Uh, brick veneer or um, brick cavity construction can be quite difficult at times. Um, if you can appreciate that the first image I shared with you around uh, the Townsville event with category three black water and sludge in properties, we found a lot of properties that had cavities full of silt and sludge as a result of flood events and whilst the water recedes and dries out um, it uh, the the sludge and contaminant is left behind in cavities so it is quite difficult at times to be able to clean those cavities effectively considering that they quite often only have a 10 mil weep hole um, in the base course so what we've done effectively is remove sections of brickwork to enable those cavities to be flushed um, satisfactorily um, and, and cleaned out. And what we've been doing rather than putting full bricks back in where we've created those openings is putting um, air ventilation bricks in. So potentially in future, um, as we inherit the construction method of each individual property, um, we'll be in a better position to drain those properties via their cavities uh, for future events. But I, I, I tend to think that brick veneer construction can be a little bit of an Achilles heel for the industry in terms of um, uh, flood mitigation. So what is the solution? Uh, new home construction, the industry is certainly uh, improving in terms of the discussions that are being had, uh, forums that are, that are being prepared. Even this discussion today, we're starting to talk about how can we be more resilient in terms of the design um of, of more resilient homes however the existing stock of those flood affected properties um there's no silver bullet there's no blanket rule that we can apply because each each home will be unique in terms of uh, the symptoms that it's presented in in the most recent events uh, the construction methods and the like um, so we need to consider each home on its own um, basis we certainly do need to see some revision of the National Construction Code to include flood risk design. Um, we recognise that quite often reform is the catalyst um, that, that drives change throughout our industry. We recognise that with the Black Saturday bushfires that I mentioned around the development of Australian standards to control bushfire design. Um, in New South Wales, uh, we're talking specifically about the reform of the state environmental planning policy and subdivision guidelines um, to better prepare communities. Uh, Wood-based materials for um, by the new, new building or existing stock can be resilient um, if they are allowed to drain and dry quickly. In our experience, hardwood is often the best um, based on the proven results that we've seen. And obviously inorganic materials, they do have durability problems um, uh, that we've experienced as well. So in terms of the current stock, this is a little bit of a risk matrix, I guess, or a solutions matrix that we've developed. Ultimately, those properties that are significantly flood prone, um, the best solution is obviously where appropriate to remove the risk, reconsider the land use. Often a practical solution might be rebuild or raise those properties um, to, a, to higher ground and utilize subfloor areas um, um, you know, for, for utility only 
not to be habitable and made of those more durable materials. And then, of course, the retroflip solution that's available for properties that may not be as extremely flood prone, um, limit the habitable spaces to the lower levels where possible and adopt those principles that are recommended in flood design guidance material. And there is a range of design guidance material at the moment, both from the Queensland government and the New South Wales government, um, but also um, industry professionals. The last Last thing I wanted to share today um, is in and around the limitations of insurance funds. So whilst we can appreciate that um, there's a need to improve resilience, there's a desire, I, I, I genuinely believe that the industry desires to improve resilience for new home building, but also the current stock of housing that's out there. Um, some of the limitations that we experience come from the availability of the funds to, in order to do that. So I've developed two case studies here just to provide a little bit of context. So this particular property, uh, timber weatherboard residents had living areas to the upper floor and utility areas mostly to the ground floor as well as a stairwell. It, it experienced um, full, water, full submersion of the property up to head height in the upper floor. Okay, so the habitable areas, flood water was up to head height and it also had some impact damage from fast flowing water. The cost of repairing this on a like for like basis, and when we say like for like, that's what insurers require us to establish, require us to understand what is the like for like cost of reinstating this property to its previous condition. And on this particular property, it was just shy of $200,000. However, the available insurance funds for that property, the, uh, the policy limitation, was only $148,000. So um, the, the consumer, the homeowner was not in a position to be able to even repair their property to its pre-existing condition, let alone taking some take into consideration what could we do to better prepare this property for a repeat event. So some significant challenges there um, for the community. This is another example um, it's a different style construction combination of sheet metal and fiber cement uh, had habitable areas to both the upper and the lower level and, and you can see there's a tide line through the lower level that uh, th this property actually went under to a greater height than that however that was the if you like the median flood level that's where the, the flood water stayed for an extended period of time weeks um, it did actually get higher than that the cost of it also had some asbestos related materials as well. The cost of repairing this property, given it had that asbestos, had a significant location cost factor to consider, was $285,000. And the, the property owner was only afforded $243,000 by comparison. So again, uh, we have significant challenges in in making this property more resilient or doing a retrofit program to this property um, given the availability of funds um, through an insurance claims process. So that concludes my presentation. Obviously, I'll be hanging around uh, for questions a bit later on. I'll hand back over to you, Paolo. Thank you. Thank you, James. You need to unshare, and I share my screen again. <clears throat> okay, so uh, very little time for me. I have a, a couple of case studies that I really will go through super quickly, but uh, Alastair will be able to send you my presentation, okay? To all of you, you should have your email. So this house from James Davison Architect was designed as a, a, a renovation, an extension for a family to be flood resistant. And what they did, they did study uh, the flow path uh, at the ground level of the house, they did uh, design solutions which were would be easy to clean out, dry out fast, uh, clean out rapidly and easily with materials which are durable, mm. avoiding points where the water can be stuck and be uh, trapped, uh, not to evacuate and dry out quickly. They use uh, flood resilient materials, 
including uh, durable timber like James was also mentioning, mostly spotted gum or other uh, types of hardwood or uh, treated pine. And also the uh, non-timber materials were chosen to be uh, easy to dry and easy to clean. The external timber wall design was basically a single skin <clears throat> uh, hardwood cladding and expanded polystyrene um, insulation, which is not affected, is not uh, soaking up water and it's fast and easy to clean and dry. Uh, the internal walls were in autoclaved hot aerated concrete and due to the lack of bracing into this material, uh, it's quite important that you uh, interface with your structural engineers so that he considered there's no bracing from the internal wall. Uh, avoiding built-in furniture was also another suggestion and was um, approved by the client. So the furniture can be moved uh, upstairs uh, as soon as you have given notice, or given notice that the flood is coming, uh, you can move up the furniture. And the services were raised, uh, of course, within the limits that are mandatory uh, into the law. So the result is uh, still nice, very nice, but uh, ready for floods, uh, flood ready house. In another case, they did um, lift a house from the level because the flood hazard level was already above the uh, floor level. So they had to raise it and they decided to raise it higher than the flood hazard level by one meter. Luckily they did because while the works were going on, so they raised one meter above the flood level, a flood came and it was much higher than expected, but still uh, within the limits that the house was raised. So therefore, as a result, Thanks to the large openings, the design choices, etc., it was very easy to dry out and clean uh, this house. And only two days after the floods, the walls were back to normal. The doors were functioning and dry, and the concrete floor was easy to clean. So no damage uh, from a, a fast flood into uh, into this uh, raised house. There are examples and experience of uh, flood resistant zone. They are limited in scope, but still they are a very interesting solution for a limited number of locations and conditions. Uh, they work and the uh, additional cost is not uh, that big, but certainly uh, this solution will not apply for uh, many cases, many locations in Australia, although it's a very interesting approach. Next steps, uh, we are um, completing the Resilient Timber Homes program. We are in phase one, design guide, a design competition, and we are doing a technology readiness assessment on the solutions that we are finding. And then in phase two, we will support some laboratory testing, full-scale testing, and IP sharing. We have a very interesting Resilient Timber Design competition uh, on at the moment. so. If you are designers, if you have friends which may be interested, please have a look at the competition website, uh, $100,000 of prize money divided into brief A and brief B into two different briefs. So have a look. And the current uh, research targets for the future are mostly related to flood, how to uh, drain and dry quickly and repair quickly. We want to support circular economy. We have a triple bottom line approach that I will not describe in details now. Please ask Alastair to forward my presentation uh, if you like. Thank you. And we look forward to your questions if there is a little bit of time. Thank you very much, both James and Paolo. That was um, an excellent uh, two series presentations. If you just stop sharing your screen, Paolo. Yes. Thanks for that. 
So we're pretty much um, just on midday now, but um, look, um, there are a couple of questions here. Um, James, um, Colin was asking about hail damage events. He uh, points out that uh, from an insurance perspective, hail damage events are right up there above bushfires. Um, but what's your thoughts on that one? Should the NCC be, should be looking to address this type of event? Yeah, thanks, Alistair. And thanks, Colin. You're, you're right. Yeah. So especially on the East Coast, um, hail events are a significant event. And I know insurers are doing a lot of work around um, policy response for hail events. So it's, uh, it's certainly um, something that's on their radar. Um, in terms of the NCC, I, I'm just thinking, you know, what, what kind of uh, mitigation could, could they consider? And, and I think that um, sheet metal roofs, obviously we can appreciate that they they perform or outperform most cement tile equivalents um, during a hail event. So look, there's potential scope there, but um, yeah, I, I don't want to get to a position where the, ha the insurance industry is dictating or informing um, the construction um, design guidance. So just want to be very clear there. I think we can do more around designing more resilient homes, but I don't want the insurance industry to be in a position where they're dictating to um, uh, the building codes board, for instance. So uh, I, I, I think um, your question's a good one, Colin. Uh, and I think um, insurers really do have hail events on their you know, top right agendas. Yeah. Mm, thanks, James. Look, we are just about questions now. Look, it really is a sort of partnership going forward, I think, with this Resilient Homes. It's about industry coming up with sort of solutions at work and working with the uh, insurance sector and, and the uh, NCC to make sure we do still have affordable homes, but homes that do yeah. still have these events. So thank you very much once again, Paolo and James. And I'll ask that. If you please forward us the questions, uh, we can prepare uh, an email with the answers, send it to you so you can forward to... Uh, the participants. No problems at all. Maybe take a couple of weeks, but we will do it. Thanks, Paola. Uh, look, just a reminder to everyone that these webinars are recorded, so you can come back and re-listen to this, or if you've enjoyed it and you want your colleagues to look at it, please uh, let them know where that link is on the Wood Solutions website. Um, look, our webinar in a month's time, in, as part of our Tuesday session, will be on timber concrete composites, a careful balance and opportunity. Um, so if you're interested in that, we certainly encourage you to join us in one month's time. We've also got a special webinar coming up in a couple of weeks' time on the 24th of May. It's at a different time, 4.30 to 5.30. It's a bit more of a sort of builder-focused webinar, um, looking at um, residential timber construction and certainly um, some advice around some of uh, solutions for seven-star minimum energy efficiency around Australia, which will be... Uh, um, introduced in October this year, and also importantly, um, a session on managing uh, the weather during construction with timber frames, as we've seen uh, a few builders uh, have some troubles recently, and we know frames will be standing out in the weather a little bit longer. Um, this is a really important one just to ensure those frames sort of uh, remain their quality. So that's the Wednesday 24th of May at 4.30 to 5.30. So thank you once again to everyone. It's been great to have you part of our webinars, and we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, webinar. Have a great day. Thanks, Alistair, and all the participants.